So again, as I mentioned, uh, with the EDGE program, um, there are 130 ACOs that are likely going to get significant funding for investment. And um, the reason that Medicare um, continues to sort of double down on the um, alternative payment models or reimbursement tied to the AAA, you know, cost quality um, satisfaction is that the the trends are not improving. You know, obviously, as we start to account for COVID spend and all the things that the government did with testing and um, supplies and ventilators and uh, reimbursement and all the COVID um, uh, impacts that it will have had, um, you know, in the person's lives that it impacted, but also in the ecosystem across healthcare as a business, those things are going to go on for a long time. And you'll see that when we stopped doing electives or we stopped having a lot of, of services being rendered in COVID, it impacted almost all of the countries that are measured under the o OECD, which is um, most of the Western, you know, um, civilization is sort of measured under this cohort. Um, COVID definitely had an impact and turned down um, the, the kinds of care that's typically provided, but that pent up demand is going to show up in 2022, 23, and 24. Obviously, this only goes through 21. So Medicare has to be really, really attentive to the fact that these um, the incurred costs that we're having to pay for for all the protections needed to support the staff, the families, the patients through COVID, the pent up demand when all all of us stop going to any kind of care setting during the the height of the original variant, uh, and then certainly until we were more sure about what it was going to be as the variants became less deadly that pent up demand is gonna play out. And so Medicare has, has consistently for the past few years said, by 2030, we're gonna get all of traditional Medicare under accountable care. Um, the reason that's the case is we pay for the spend that's shown here where the United States is the top spender um, against the rest of you know, the, the Western you know, world. We're significantly higher uh, in many cases, double you know our our cohort that we belong to, um, but things that we measure like infant mortality or, or um, age average age at death, uh, like all of those kinds of you know global factors, we don't fare as well as the cohort that's largely together and it's it is spend an apparatus for care. So to address that, and because the way we pay for healthcare in the United States is through taxation, uh, federal income tax. Um, we're, we're, we're consistently facing some really big problems. The other things that I think are important for us to talk about just to set the stage for how you become an ACO is um, we've created um, two other problems that, that exist. The first of which is that um, as we get sicker in the United States, we've built a, a sick care ecosystem versus a healthcare ecosystem. And what I mean by that is we often don't make adjustments in patient or provider behaviors uh, quick enough or to align to things that the rest of the, the Western world in this OECD data set um, really do well. So on the, the left-hand chart, um, this is what typically happens as it relates to um, you know, primary care and physician visits happening um, across the world. Um, as it relates to us in the United States, we don't do a good job of leveraging primary care as a um, as a typical approach to managing the longevity of patient lives to quarterback all of the potential specialty, uh, care to to manage disease burden as a whole, to manage the whole person. We often don't do that as well in the United States as we do in the rest of, of this cohort. And we also do something on the other end, which is also telling, which is um, we don't um, we don't staff for the right kinds of care, even in our inpatient days. Um, if you think about what we're saying here, we're saying we're quickly getting people out of hospital beds often as a uh, dependency on the way the hospitals make money in the United States. Um, COVID was not a good business for health care. We're anchored organizations that acute anchor those um, integrated delivery networks. So hospital, you know, anchored organizations really fared poorly financially because the bed stays were really long. Electives were turned off. 
So in other words, the care of patients in those facilities was world-class, but the dollars related to that care was not how they typically make money. They make money with, you know, total joint replacements. They make money with neurological and cardio cardiological surgical um, kinds of interventions. They don't, they want you in and out of that bed quickly because that is the methodology that allows for good revenue to be produced out of each bed. And because we don't have a lot of beds, um, the business of healthcare at the acutes are really quickly in and out, get persons up and mo mobile and ambulatory and, and as quickly as possible, get that next person into the bed for the elective procedure. So you have, you have a lightly used primary care approach and a quickly used hospital approach. Um, and the reality is those two things in combination with how much we've really built a sick care apparatus in the United States sort of puts us on this trajectory um, where we're going to have, you know, this kind of this kind of world where alternative payments or value-based care payments really put um, the business of healthcare at the front of disease eradication. Like the, the business of healthcare is going to leapfrog the clinical component of healthcare for, for a piece of time only because we can't operate the way we have operated for the past 65 years. We spent lots of money to build hospitals in the 50s. Nationally, we, we put federal dollars into, into play to build large anchor hospitals. And then the states um, competed to, to draw industry into those states by also putting money into building these really big um, acute organizations, hospital anchor organizations. Uh, that works great for the kind of business we just talked about. But once you move into value-based care, the number one place that Medicare looks for to reduce cost is the acute. So, you know, unplanned hospitalizations, readmissions, transitional care management, those are all programs inside of programs that you get paid for, for doing these things that reduce the hospital spend. So value-based care is going to shape the landscape. When that's in play, one of the two, one of the next two things that happens is you put primary care largely back in the driver's seat because the attribution for these models all are tied to visit types called evaluation and maintenance visits um, that the practices is performing as a natural function of a practice. And those triggers um, tied to that kind of care. Um, are the ways these models all work for determining who has the care responsibility and therefore the upside opportunity uh, in an ACO for additional dollars if you can come in under budget, which is called benchmark. So attribution turf wars really are um, simply stating that the, the payers are going to come and buy primary care. Large retailers, so CVS is an example of that, Walgreens, um, Retailers that are now owning health plans, so CVS Aetna, are going are gonna to buy up practices because they can um, largely win the attribution war if they can win primary care and, and own enough of the primary care delivery mechanism. They can actually be a health plan um, using their apparatus for all of their network building, all of their utilization management, denials management, grievance management, like all that infrastructure that's important for the plan. They already have, and they can, if they own the practices, they'll own the attribution of these models. And under reach, they can um, actually have the responsibility of managing patient care and then really doing a good job of reusing the apparatus for the plan or the health, or the health payer side on the, the problem of managed care. So they'll bring, they'll bring innovation there. Um, if you're not doing things to sort of work in this value-based care uh, arrangement. Um, member substitution will become rampant. What that means is that somebody will decide that they're going to do a version of care that's equivalent to what you might do. So think of skilled home health, for instance, for really sick patients or hospice even. Uh, if an organization is in, uh, is in the, the throes of managing care, and they're on the hook for every dollar spent in, Medi in Medicare, uh, specifically in traditional CMS programming like ACO Reach or uh, even like enhanced tracks of the MSSP. Um, you're going to not use the hospice benefit unless you can have a qualified, high-performing network of hospices and home health organizations that you yourself manage their payment. You manage what you define as quality. You manage what you define as um 
value, if they can't meet that, then you'll build something similar and you won't call it hospice or home health, but you also won't lose the revenue. And therefore you're not getting penalized for things that are happening as a, happening as a cost in the ecosystem. So to be able to do this, to be able to build a adequate network that's high performing, you're gonna have to have transparency. Um, transparency really means as an ACO, you're gonna have all the detail about what gets paid for and who gets um, services and why. And parts of what transparency will bring to you is the ability to measure quality of care and outcomes. And um, you'll start doing things that research does. And I'll give you a real world example. Total joint replacements are um, very much a service rendered at the hospital that is uh, a money maker for that part of the ecosystem, the business of healthcare. Hospitals make money in total joint replacements. Um, what research would tell you is that if you ask a person to subjectively rank their pain prior to a joint replacement, saying a knee replacement as an example, if their pain scores aren't statistically uh, aligning to five or greater on the zero to 10 pain scale that's used, um, they will not have a better than current outcome with a joint replacement. So hospitals don't use that research to limit the number of uh, joint replacements, re replacements that they do because they're in the business of doing joint replacements. So that's not research that has impact on their care delivery until you're now at risk for those patient lives. And you would say, okay, the best clinical outcomes, again, so mar marrying business related components under value-based care to clinical outcomes, provided by the transparency of these facts, married together, have us start waiting for a person to actually get the level of care related to a joint replacement until it's going to be a good outcome. So they would need to be consistently reporting six, seven, eight, nine, you know, 10 levels of pain such that when we do the joint replacement, which is an incredibly invasive procedure, the rehab is very painful. It's it's lengthy amount of time before you're, you know, sort of fully functional. Um, you go through that knowing that you're going to have really good outcomes. That's just an example of marrying research, the clinical side to the financial side. And again, today, the perverse incentives are do as many as you can because we get, make, we get to make the same amount of money, whether it's going to have, you know, what we would qualify as um, great outcomes or, you know, successful outcomes. That's not a part of the equation today, but it will be tomorrow. Um, Obviously, with things that happened in COVID, we, we for the first time, were able to double down on things we knew were real and rational, that telemedicine, remote patient monitoring had a real place in healthcare. But when you weren't getting paid for it, again, business driving clinical, um, when you weren't getting paid for it, or if it wasn't going to be a thing you were rewarded for, it was a lot of risk to take on, um, you know, not having those patients come to you not having encounters where you get an office visit and potentially get to do an ENM two, three, four, five level uh, visit. So a higher level of code, therefore a higher level of reimbursement. With telemedicine waivers and the things that happened under COVID, that all got proved to be a very valuable part of care. Um, and so again, as you're at risk, you will do things like flight your kind of care based upon the severity and acuity of patients with telemedicine playing a prominent role both for lower acuity, but also for care management and coordination over a journey. Uh, so the knee replacement journey, for instance, would be a lot, you know, PT might go into the home in the early days, but eventually that person's driving, they're going to PT in the clinic. But all throughout that time, you can do coordinated events. You can understand, like, are they having any, did they have a uh, something happen during PT, which caused a patella fracture, which does occasionally happen? Like, and now what do we do? We get them in a brace and they're immobile for a period of time. So the patella can actually have the ability to grow back. Uh, that, you know, that fracture without any intervention. So like, those are the kind of things that you can do even in a bundle around uh, joint replacement. Um, Medicare Advantage is going to grow because Medicare Advantage is going to get an ACO world. Even under reach, they can participate. You'll notice that CVS has a large uh, ACO reach offering. Um, it's a unique way for them to quickly add members without having to do things like hire actors that are on certain news channels at night where lots of people are watching, you know, the, the evening news and they're getting updates about how they might look into Humana or United or Aetna's new program related to, you know, uh, prescription pharmacy event um, or, or um, prescription pharmacy product that they're offering. So expect that growth to occur. It's a different game here than it is under traditional MSSP value-based care. What I mean by that is um, they're very good at building networks. They're going to bring that equation to um, sort of to the apparatus related to Medicare populations. 
but it's also a different game because in traditional Medicare Advantage, you're limited to the number of dollars you can make or a percentage of profit you can make in it as a health plan. So when I can get these kinds of organizations under my control, I can push all the risk down from this part of the world onto this part of the world. And I don't have that limit to how much gross margin I can make. Uh, so be mindful, like that is a real change that's gonna take shape as we continue down this path where there's a lot of ownership from MedAdvantage actually playing real material and big roles as it relates to sort of how Medicare quickly gets these patients off of traditional fee-for-service, blue card Medicare, and into accountable care. And the last two, I think, somewhat hung, hang together. There's going to be a consistent pressure for us to understand the impact of social determinants. And I'll talk a little bit about why that matters in a minute. Um, but the other thing that's going to be important is if we don't do things well, <clears throat> rural markets, underserved markets, at-risk markets are going to consistently be um, sort of measuring and, and managing uh, harder methodologies and, and related to access to prejudice, et cetera. So imagine today if, if, if an organization takes over care delivery of a very specific kind of care, I'm just going to pick something out of the air. So some sort of cancer program gets started and, and, and a number of really big, almost monopoly size organizations choose to be the national provider of those services, which is likely going to be some of what we face in the future. They're going to choose to do things based upon gross margins. And it's a lot harder to get to patients or to serve patients or to have access availability in rural markets than it is in suburban markets. Um, I live in the fastest growing county in Florida right now. And at the moment, there are five large health systems building um, facilities in support of this part of growth in the state of Florida, because again, that's where the people will be. That's where they can have margin rich patients, high value patients. If I was living in the slower or slowest growing County in the, in the state of Florida, which if you know, our state, it's cattle and oranges. Um, that's what's in those parts of Florida. And there is not good access. It's if, 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 if anything, there's critical access hospital, maybe two towns over. So if I'm a business and I'm taking on the approach of oncology care across the United States, I'm not going to look at the markets where cattle and, and oranges are what's in, in, the, in the county. I'm going to look at the markets like where I live, where the growth of the population is just spurring on enough opportunity for us to have really good patients. And so that's the business that's coming for us, um, you know, tying these two things together. If you, if you don't recognize that a person's access and, their, and their, the available care around them has an impact on care, and you don't address that with some version of reducing disparities, then the problem we're going to have is there's going to be really, really tough and differentiated care being provided just because the business of healthcare is going to require it. So that's the place that I think the government does have a unique place to play, which is how do I ensure that I don't have such disparities between different markets under the umbrella of the United States of America under the federal government? How do I incentivize these things to be equivalent or as close to, to as equivalent as possible? And so this is what's happening. Um, you know, we could spend, and maybe somebody will ask for us to do some of this, but we could spend 30 minutes on each of these and maybe even do a mini webinar series on, on each of them because I think it's impactful. Um, but I do think that like understanding what's in front of us is important. Uh, I got a question in real time. What do you think, um, or do you think uh, FQHCs will play a role in the disparity? 100%. Um, Rural health organizations, the federally qualified health clinics, um, they have a unique opportunity to actually be the, the solution or a big part of the solution for this, uh, this particular problem. The thing I would say to anyone who's um, managing or part of leadership over uh, one or multiple FQHCs is to figure out how to get involved with um, growing through partnerships, or if you're already big enough, how to get uh, into an up and downside risk model. Um, you have care responsibility that looks like whole person care. You're one of the, you know, one of the few places in the United States where you think about the person as a whole person, often including mental, emotional, behavioral, dental, um, like you can have all of that care under an FQHC. Uh, and so when those things are in place and you, and you can start using transparency, you can start measuring how, how much your benchmark is in the county for global spend 
and then how much you're actually able to do things to solve patient problems, to avert crisis, to provide access and care, um, it becomes a pretty clear and, and fairly straight line from where you are today delivering that care to where you are tomorrow making significantly more revenue just because you're able to deliver a good product to a part of the world that's pretty tough to do it in. So yes, uh, very much uh, FQHGs will have a role to play in reducing disparity and more than likely if they take risk and can manage the opportunity in front of them, they'll be able to consistently stay ahead of the needs of those persons because of the incremental revenue they can they can capture out of alternative payments. All right, um, any other questions before we move on to some of the things I think and then some of the things that uh, I ask chat GPT just for fun to see how different the, you know, 25 years of doing this is relative to the latest and greatest AI. Uh, so any questions on that last slide? All right. Um, ask away in the Q and a session if you, if you want, uh, as we go along, but thank you for the question about FQHCs. Um, so this is my perspective. If um, if I'm, uh, you know, a little bit about us, we, we, as a, as a leadership team, have been managing the, the lives, um, the global risk in many cases, sometimes professional risk. Um, we've been uh, answering these questions about like, why do you take risk? What do you, what do you do when you take risk? What does it mean to manage care? What are the challenges? Um, and so when I think about this question, it's, it's through the lens of having to overcome um, what I think are the top 10 challenges that face, face ACOs. Um, so let's let's talk about them. And I said I'd mention SDOH. I'll probably talk about it one or two more times after the slide. Um, we grew up uh, managing both commercial relationships with patients as well as federal relationships, meaning uh, in the military and armed forces, it's the DHA and the vet Veterans Affair. Those are two different types of care being delivered to uh, persons that are ready for military deployment and active duty and folks that are not, um, that would be in the veterans administration side. So whether they're, they truly are a veteran or just not ready for, um, ready for combat uh, from an injury or some other thing. Uh, and so we've done it there. We've done it in Indian health services. We've done it in, in North, North America inside of Canada's uh, Ministry of Health. We've done it over in Europe um, with the United Kingdom's NHS. And, and one of the things that we learned from all of that work is when you, when you take the lens of social determinants, which are often things like safety, stress, uh, access to care, uh, financial stability, food stability. Um, when you take those things into your, your care delivery and your model of care as a variable that matters, um, you, start to, you start to evolve your care delivery. Um, and when you don't, if you're at risk, you start to see these patients slip through the cracks and they'll often be the kinds of patients that end up being uh, in rising risk, which means there, there's there's some ver some form of crisis about to happen, where without kind of wraparound cares using social determinants to determine what gets wrapped around, these patients seek the highest cost locations of care, often because of things that are avoidable, but without management, they just end up in the in the emergency department. And then based on often the complexity and the fact that there's not a lot known in the emergency department in the United States about these per these persons that show up, um, they get a lot of diagnostics and then they often get admitted and um, often they come back because that's where they learned that they got support. So one of the things I would tell an ACO if, if they were starting today is have a plan for social determinants. Understand your population, not just by the clinical severity or their HCC and RAF scores, um, understand them by also, even if you just use the geo, which is neighborhood level detail, um, understand based upon where your population centers are and where your, um, you know, heat map your patient population to know like how many of them are living in this particular neighborhood where they have safety issues, where they have concerns for, uh, being able to pay for co-pays for medications, you know, they need to be on for repeat beds, right? Like if you know those kinds of things, you, part of your model of care can include social workers or even high, um, bachelor degree holders in sociology and psychology that can just be part of your coordination event uh, team. Like that's parts of what you'll have to think about. Um, the other things you'll have to think about include, well, what happens when um, I want to control 
some parts of the model of care through an integrated solution. <clears throat> ACOs don't have an, uh, an EHR. Like there isn't, a, unless you're a hospital owned or unless you're a large primary care practice or FQHCs that are standardized to like one instance of a solution, the ACO itself doesn't have a technology that's interfaced between the providers and their patients. And so as an ACO, you're going to have to figure out like, what do I do to work through the fact that I don't have a, a technology solution in the hands of my providers and they are doing things that potentially are 100% appropriate, but they're not doing things that if they were done in that same appropriate level of care visit would also drive benefit for how we beat benchmark and therefore gain more savings. Um, and so you, you would need to understand that Part of what you have to do is solve for this gap. The ACO is going to get lots of data from Medicare. How do you get that data situationally and contextually into the hands of clinicians? Um, and how do you do it in such a seamless way that it doesn't change their, their synchronicity of the practice? It doesn't change their behaviors. It should be an easy button solution. It should not be something they have to add to their daily huddle or change their slotting paradigm for how frequently they can see their patients. Most of these Practices around 15 minutes slotting paradigms. It can't become 20 or 25. They they won't be solvent. Like so, you've, you've got to figure this out, and that's a big problem because the H the EHR is not an answer today, um, unless again like you're hospital owned and everybody's on Epic or you're um, you know a large you know wholly owned primary care practice that employs everybody and everyone uses Athena. Like those exist, but that's not typical. So if you're a typical uh, organization, you got to solve for what are you going to do for technology. The other thing I would tell you is even if great technology is in place, most of it doesn't know how to do anything with claims data. So Medicare is going to give you three years of history on all of your patients. So ACO started in 2012. So those first ACOs got 2009 data. Almost all of them have carried forward 2009 through 2020. You know, we've gotten all the way up to April or sorry, March of 2024 data. So they're going to be managing data that might be impactful for surveillance, might be impactful for you know disease surveillance, might be impactful for trending, might be impactful for things that worked in the past. If you've if you've had good outcomes with hospital, you know, uh, unplanned hospitalization or um, you know overuse of the acutes, like what did you do back when it worked really well? Like <clears throat> that data comes in, but it doesn't then make its way into clinician hands. And again, because you don't own an, EM, an EMR EHR. Like there, the interoperability play is is a very very tough one. We talk in in great lengths about like that it's real, but in but in the real world, it's real in the sense that technically it works, but functionally it's it's problematic. Uh, the reason it's problematic is because it typically impacts like outcomes, uh, and outcomes are driven by workflow. So if your day in a primary care practice is a daily huddle to talk about the very specific cases scheduled for that day that are the most problematic cases that you might want to really just talk about before the day starts, you can't break down that process with more documentation or, or more you know, request from a third party ACO is, uh, is a third party in this example. So what you what would be ideal is is if you gave the the clinical workflows, including that daily huddle, you know, face sheets that says, you know, I I know what you're going to do today, and you want to talk about the sickest, you know, four or five patients each day. Here's the printout of those patients, and there there's something that that are easily reviewed as part of what you already do. The same with um, things like an unplanned hospitalization when a discharge occurs. Can you quickly have your team be notified that this patient who was just discharged for an unplanned hospital event, um, we need to see them as quickly as possible because we're quarterbacking the care. And this means some version of, of exacerbation or new symptom um, or crisis has occurred. And that should be a thing seamless to the practice that they already know how to do, but it should be optimized. It should be optimized for is there a social determinant that's new? Did, did this person move in with their daughter where they don't feel safe, where there's not, you know, uh, or did they lose transportation that was at their other home because the, the local church would come to their original home, but their daughter doesn't have that. She lives further out. Like those kind of things it can be things you know that don't change what you already do, but, but can optimize them. Um, that would include these transitions of care, right? So when somebody goes in the hospital and they get discharged, if they're discharged home, like, Great. What do you do to keep them from readmission? Because as we know, that's a 40% more 
um, an expense if they go back in for the same diagnosis in a short window of time, usually 30 days is the measure. So if we're readmitted for the same diagnosis within 30 days, we can expect a really expensive hospital stay. So how do we manage that transition back to home? Or if it's not to home, how do we stop the skilled facility to, to acute to skilled facility to acute cycle that often happens for really sick patients? And again, you probably know um, that your, your higher performing practices have workflow here. But how do you ensure that you provide extra visibility and where possible incremental data that might be valuable um, for things they could do better? Um, because again, your job is to is to play a, a, the role of support uh, such that you can ensure things that are often very problematic or very challenging get faced differently. Um, <clears throat> These three that uh, I mentioned, four, five, and, and six kind of go together. The reason that they're called out separately is clinical workflows can be the daily huddle, and that doesn't have anything to do with your transitions of care. Um, and emergency department visits often happen in the United States because honestly, um, we don't do a good job of having an awareness that our patients are not taking the repeat meds that we know they should be taking based upon their disease state. So like if metformin's not being taken, if Parkinson's meds aren't being taken, if any of the meds to manage um, high impact uh, behavioral health problems aren't being taken, those kinds of things when they happen can be seen in the data, back to the transparency slide from before, and can be used to ensure you know a visit needs to occur, which you're already good at doing visits, and you now know why. The why for that visit is this person's quit taking their Parkinson's meds, their metformin, and their you know Zoloft for, for managing their depression. And that in combination means if you don't get them in to sort out, is it, is it a problem with like GI distress or symptoms related to anxiety? Like what's made you stop taking these meds so that you so that you can get in front of it? That is a third of why emergency department visits happen. So like an ACO could have a very simple tool that just looks at repeat medication refills because all that data is what you're going to get inside of CMS's data stream. And you can literally start defining a way to manage those patients before they become an emergency department visit, which by the way, that patient I just described also becomes a hospital visit, which by the way, if they're seen again, because they still didn't get it sorted out at the hospital because they didn't come back to you to get your, their home meds filled, right? They got enough for three or four days from the hospital, but now they're out of those. They didn't come back to you because you weren't proactive. They're back in the hospital to get their meds again. Um, and so again, it's it's about this um, approach that you guys would need to sort of think through in your model of care. You don't have to do them all. These are just the 10 biggest challenges I think that sort of face the ACO. Uh, and then we move into our first uh, business challenge. Um, in many of these models, unless you get the edge money up front, there is a period of time where you're operating on very, very, very few people because the the often the MSSP programming um, has a very substantial delay where you have to cash flow what you're doing uh, under just fee-for-service methodologies until you get your shared savings check. And those checks go out, you know, October, sometimes late September, but usually October of the year following your service. So you would know you're getting it in about July or August, but it would be embargoed until the payment comes out. And that's usually September, October. So you're cash flowing all of services that you're going to deliver uh, incremental to fee for service things. You're cash flowing those in most models until the following year, 10 months into that next year. So many organizations bet the farm on that first year being successful. They need to get a good benchmark for Medicare. You can figure those things out with like looking at your county, looking at what the, the global rates are. You can then look at your population and see what the multiplier of your risk score does. It's typically $10,000. Very easy math. Ten thousand dollars is kind of the natural national average of global spend per Medicare patient, and you multiply that roughly by their HCC score. That'll get you a close approximate. There are tools out there. There's a whole bunch of them you can look at that have um, either QE uh, or VRDC. So VRDC is a API that you can get um, direct access to Medicare's data, and you can look at your practices you're going to bring into the world of your ACO and you can see, okay, what's likely their benchmark using this very back of the envelope math or using one of those tools that'll tell you exactly like here's what the spend is for that for that practice against their risk risk adjusted. And you can see whether it's good, bad, or uh, or in the middle. Um, so 
financial stability uh, is a is a challenge to overcome, but I would recommend using tools that allow you to run downhill versus having to knife fight every year to make money. Um, and then, as I mentioned, the multiplier by that global average is your HCC and risk adjustment factor. Uh, if you don't have a workflow that's been hardened across your organization about how to document and code, um, you're going to face an uphill battle of making money in the ACO space. The look back period is about two years. And so if you've not been coding well for the past 24 months, that problem is going to take two years for you to resolve. So just be mindful that start today. And hopefully this is um, this is a thing you've already been doing for a little over two years, such that when you get in the models, your patients are, are are actually coded at the right level, such that you can have an achievable and therefore uh, achievable benchmark and therefore likelihood of of really doing well in a shared savings environment. Um, and then the last one ties some of these together, which is it's great to support daily huddles. It's great to do things around your hospital and emergency department visits. It's another thing to know about preventative things or clinical decision support that can happen in the situation or context of a patient visit. So often ACOs, you know, there's not any HR, so they have to find solutions that can um, support, uh, you know, banners inside of the workflow, like part of the UI, the user experience can have a banner, can have a baseball card, like statistics about this person that might be valuable. It can have alerts or notifications. And so, there are a lot of tools out there um, that help you with making decisions around like, what do you do at the point of care to ensure when a patient's actually in that practice um, that the services that need to be rendered get rendered, um, especially as it relates to things like RAF score or managing high expense costs of care. Uh, so again, you need to have a solid solution for point of care. And then you got to decide whether you're doing care management and care management I always define as like what happens between encounters. Um, how are you engaging those patients between any kind of you know point of care and, and engagement itself? Um, you can use, like we mentioned, uh, telemedicine. You can use you know telephonic. You can use all kinds of support paradigms under care management. The real challenges are deciding what do you do versus what are the practices under the ACO do. Uh, like, do you do it all or do you delegate some of it? Most organizations have a hybrid where they do some version of care management because they have the claims data. And then they 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 train up or they 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 co-create a model of care where the practices do things that are more EMR centric. Um, so questions about these challenges. These were what I thought of as the sort of top ten challenges that we've we've seen ACOs face and and organizations that take risks face uh, over the last three decades. Any questions about these? All right. So for fun, um, these are. Uh, Chat GPT. Uh, so uh, it's it's funny. Like I ask uh, the same question of myself that I did. You know, literally typing into Chat GPT. If you haven't played around with with that, it's a very 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 interesting tool. Um, but when I ask, like, what are the what are the challenges that you know that ACOs face? Um, very similar. Um, care coordination. I called care management. Data integration. I called interoperability. Financial sustainability. We actually use the same words, which is crazy. Um, Engagement and alignment of providers. I didn't talk about that in my um, in my worldview because I think you've got to get good at doing that before you even are an ACO. And I think it's um, also looking at whether or not these 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 organizations are going to have participated in risk with you are already somewhat sophisticated in their model of care. If they're still waiting for someone across the transom to see them and they don't have slots available for urgent needs. Um, like that's a simple way of understanding: Are you getting the right patient or the right providers aligned to uh, aligned to you? Um, so again, I think they've rolled the way they've defined this. I think they've rolled you know three of my tiles under one, so probably a little more succinct than me. Um, but again, I think you put the four and five together, and they match my tiles three, three, four, and five, and six. Uh, I didn't mention regulatory and compliance. Honestly, the ACO market has been saturated with folks that can really help you get the governance and structure right. Um, I would say you can buy a partial compliance officer. Many of them are out there. They're really good um, versus trying to staff the, all of that, you know, compliance, regulatory and governance uh, inside of your own, inside of your own organization. Um, we mentioned no EHR. Um, they sort of think of it as you've got to have something that allows you to do it. Uh, and then they think of risk management more actuarially than I would have always thought of it. Um, 
I do think what they're thinking about is sort of model of care improvements and they're using maybe a simplified and more succinct word uh, or set of words. Um, any any questions about either chat GPT or you know my thoughts about challenges that face the ACO? All right, and then uh, I got uh, an anonymous attendee that says, I like the analogy of the baseball card, but I would also add the daily box score to make sure you can see trends. I think that's great. I like, uh, if you've not seen Moneyball, the Brad Pitt baseball movie or the books that sort of were the lead up to, to Moneyball, I always mention this as a great pop culture reference. Um, statistics change the way Major League and all of baseball now scouts. Uh, if you've not watched that movie, um, and you didn't know baseball scouting, it always used to be by the physique, the appearance of a person, uh, his throwing or batting stance. It was never, did he get on base or did he throw strikes? Um, or did, you know, did he strike out or, you know, did he, what was his on base percentage? Well, it was, it was never those things. They were relying on what they had seen work from a physique or a batting stance or a style or, um, you know, the, the, the cadence or some other thing their eyes could tell them. And so for a hundred years, we scouted that way. And then a Harvard graduate focused on statistics and realized we're doing it wrong. That's what's happening, uh, not the doing it wrong, but that's what's happening in, in medicine. We are literally going to shift our reimbursement models to pay for outcomes instead of paying for the volume of services being provided. So if you haven't watched that, um, it's a great movie on its own, but it's really applicable to what's, what's happening and what's gonna continue to happen in medicine. Again, it's Moneyball is the name of the movie. All right, um, two slides that I think are really, really helpful for helping people understand like really how to do um, what's responsible, what responsible persons are that manage risk. A fool takes risk and a professional manages risk. So if you want to step out of one corridor uh, of sort of being the taker of risk and you want to step into the other corridor, which is managing it, this is a good representation of the, the capability stack that you need to have. And I'm friends with and, and like to borrow Katie Land's, um, her perspective on this. So this was uh, from Home Care 100 in January of 2023 at Miami. So if you were at the show, um, you would have seen this as part of her presentation. But I think it still uh, is very valuable and holds true for what organizations have to do. And it starts at the bottom. Um, and the recognition that um, healthcare built its financial and reimbursement tooling on one kind of in, uh, of capability. Think of it as, as railroad tracks and trains. And it built its electronic health records on airports and runways. And they don't really work together. Um, you know, you might do a request for coverage using a 270 or 271, an authorization uh, event. You might do that in an EHR, but that's it. You make sure they have coverage so you can render your service. You document typically in SOAP notes, subjective objective assessment plan in the EHR. And then you push out a super bill or a UB4 and you get reimbursed. But <clears throat> there's a whole thing that happens inside of the EHR related to clinical decision support, related to uh, the ability to understand drug to drug, drug to problem, um, drug to allergy, like all those things that, that are built into the EHR sidestep your potential crisis that the that you placing an order that's you know it could counterintuitive or contraindicated to that particular patient journey um the ehr does all of that but it doesn't look at all of what's happened outside of the ehr so if you don't have the meds documented completely because you, the hospital doesn't hand you their home med list and they discontinued three of your meds and started three different ones and you're now operating on the assumption that your med list is accurate and you didn't, there's not a med reconciliation event for some reason, and you place your first order, the EHR does not have the ability to take in the hospital's detail without there being a human intervention because all their, all their rules run in the front end where persons type in data. So figuring out how to know that's real and then figuring out how to take in all the claims data, which is going to include all your NDC level meds. Um, and then having the ability for there to be that kind of integration is a real discipline. Um, you know, it sits below and around the EHR and the administrative practice management or reimbursement. You know, think of all the 
Mac or the clearinghouse work you have to do to get paid, right? It sits in and around all of that, but it often connects those two things. Once it's connected, then you can get to data and analytics. And those things are foundational. Like this, this idea that we're going to, you know, see patients when they cross our transom, that's like, you know, picking a, a major league baseball player by, you know, his physique and, and how he swings the bat. And it's, it's not the way of tomorrow. It's the way of yesterday. So once you get those foundational components in place, interoperability an EHR, um, a good clearinghouse and, and revenue cycle side, and you're running data on both the airport and the train uh, and locomotion, you know, parts of your business, then you can start working on what you're really, really good at, which is how does our model of care and clinical capabilities evolve such that we can start seeing the patients that need our services that are aligned to us through attribution or voluntary alignment if you're an ACO reach that have needs that we actually today solve really well. And how do we get those persons in front of our highest level license to work at the top of their license? And how do we use care management, telephonic and telemedicine to support patients in between encounters? Like literally that's what you you should be thinking about as your roadmap to build towards readiness. It doesn't mean you can't start with a really good benchmark and figure it out. But if you're gonna do these builds as you go, um, make sure you know your benchmark, make, make sure you've been coding for a period of time such that you have appropriately coded patients for risk adjustment. Um, and then you should have, you know, really good line of sight to success. And then one last thing, and I'm gonna open it up to questions. One last thing that I think I have thought always valuable for organizations to really, really, really be thinking about is transitions are, or how patients themselves move from a state um, so focus first on this triangle. I probably should have done this as two separate slides, but focus first on this triangle on the left. The, the largest part of any panel of patients, unless you're in some specialty kind of um, uh, like an ISNP, uh, most organizations are going to have the largest part of their impaneled patients being, you know, what we consider healthy patients. Um, Medicare itself is a is a fairly healthy population. You know, 97% of Medicare is is pretty stable and well-managed. The 3% usually live up here in this chronically complex or advanced illness estate. But here's the problem. I, as a person, um, have been in the healthy bucket almost all of my life. I've had two things that moved me up into chronic um, happen in the course of my life. They're managed today with repeat meds, which brought me back down to healthy. So now my job is to take my repeat meds, one in, one in the morning, one at night, uh, and then to have lab results, you know, verifying that I'm in the right ranges for my specific, you know, chronic conditions, but I live back in healthy. So um, persons will move from, um, you know, band of need or severity or acuity to band of need um, until they get something that's life limiting and often advanced illness. And then they, they may hang out here for a period of time um, before they potentially are, are going to pass. Um, and so what's hard about this is that there is not a place to do surveillance in an EMR. Like, think about it. They're often um, episodic. They're very much soap, soap notes. Um, you, you, your assessment is in a 15 minute window and your plan is either um, a medication or a referral typically. And so again, you're often um, really trying to understand like what what type of patient is is this, and if you know, and if you've gotten to know your your patients over a long period of time, you know these persons by name and by by their specific needs before they're even an, um, on your schedule. It's the persons that are down here that don't come very frequently that you're relying on whatever you saw them last for to determine what to do. What would be game changing for you guys to take in into your behavior? And I like the money ball example here again is instead of just thinking about who is in your electronic health record, where you've had an encounter. And again, this ACO don't have health records or, or EHRs. They, they have to rely on the, the claim side of the equation. So the ideal here is for the ACO to figure out, okay, the big three things you've got to really get right are understanding the social determinants of, of your persons by neighborhood. The neighborhood level detail will literally tell you Nine out of 10 persons that live in this neighborhood have safety issues, transportation issues, stress issues, financial issues, et cetera, right? So, so know that about a person because it lives in the data um, that the ACO has. 
know that about a person, even if they're one of these that you don't see very frequently, that you don't know, like you know these, because that'll inform just like the statistics of who to scout as a good player for a major league team, that'll inform your decision-making and it'll inform how your model of care improves over time. It'll inform how you treat patients over time, but do it in a way that doesn't interrupt your, your current practice. Like it can't be disruptive to the practice. So SDOH is a thing I would tell you really important to do. Access gets into this next step. Um, these colors do not, I mean, they, they kind of match, but I'll be honest with you. This particular triangle, if it was drawn to scale, would actually take up almost all of these other triangles in the way that the model sh has been shifted for uh, alternative payments, um, value-based care, ACO, accountable care, right? All of what really should be the way you picture this primary care role is that it, it should be a part of and a majority of the, the things happening in all other triangles here. So one transition is to move from one level of need to the next, but but the other kind of transition is based upon location or locale of care. And you've got to manage access and coordination um, together as a, as a real important and valuable part of what your success methodology is going to be in, as, as an ACO. It's like literally the lowest hanging fruit. If, if you're not interrogating the claims data to understand why emergency, to vi emergency department visits are happening for patients multiple times where they were non-emergent, like if you're not using the NYU model or some other model that determines was this emergency visit, primary care treatable, avoidable, urgent, like there's, there's about 12 classifications the NYU model gives you. Again, if this is a person that happens to not be seen by you a lot, but the claims data is they're going out to the emergency room for, for tr tr uh, treatment for primary care related items, your job is to get them into your clinic and actually know that that's a behavior that's happening over here. And so um, you're going to know all of this because of claims data. Literally all of this is going to exist in a, in a in the train and, and train track scenario, and you're over here working at the airport. Uh, and so it's it's important for you guys to figure out like, okay, the ACO has this real important data that if you filter it through the lens of, okay, some of this is because they literally can't get any access any other way uh, because of social determinant needs, they don't have transportation, they, they've only ever been served by their critical access hospital, like whatever it is, um, you need to filter this claims history through the lens of these components and then figure out how you manage access and SESDOH with your team coordinating. And your team can be the ACO or you can push it down through training and, um, and cohort or chase list. You can push that coordination down to the practice. But this is the game that you should play first. Like if I'm, if I'm giving you what I think is the secret to success in your first few years of ACOs, it is literally understanding how are persons using care? Why are they using care? What level of care are they using? Is it appropriate? And then how do I build coordination such that I am a triangle that's much bigger and cut across all of these different locations of service?